The uterus, what's normal and what is not? Hi friends, I am Dr. Natalie Crawford and today I'm here to talk to you about the uterus. You only have one, probably, and it is a very, very important organ. So the uterus is essential for reproduction. Now, does that mean you have to have a uterus to have a baby? No, you can always use what we call a carrier or somebody else who carries the pregnancy for you. But for most of us, we're trying to get pregnant and using our uterus. And did you know there can be birth defects of your uterus and different problems that you may have never heard of? So I wanna break all of that down in a quick video today. I am Dr. Natalie Crawford. I am a board certified OBGYN and reproductive endocrinologist or a fertility doctor. I would love it if you would subscribe to this channel if you wanna learn more about your body. Let's dive in. So your uterus actually starts by being formed in two different little buds. So I want you to think about as you're a baby inside your mom, two little buds of what we call malarian tissue. These little buds extend, so they elongate, and then they fuse together, and then the midline portion reabsorbs, and you have one uterus. These tissues make up the upper one-third of the vagina, the cervix, the entire uterus, and the fallopian tubes. The ovaries come from other tissues, the lower two-thirds of the vagina come from other tissues. So these little buds that elongate, fuse, and reabsorb, that forms upper one-third vagina, cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes. Abnormalities can happen all along this pathway, and it's so fascinating. Common abnormalities is called an arcuate uterus. This is essentially just a variation of normal. So the septum has almost reabsorbed, except there's a teeny little dip at the top, a very mild heart-shaped uterus. This has no change in reproductive outcome, meaning there's no higher incidence of miscarriage or preterm birth or anything like that. However, we need to make sure that we know it's arcuate and not one of the sister types that sometimes can have reproductive outcomes. So the next abnormality that's truly an abnormality that we have to worry about is called a uterine septum. A uterine septum is where this midline avascular portion failed to reabsorb completely. And in scenarios like this, we see hugely different reproductive outcomes. The number one thing that we see is an increased prevalence of miscarriage. The prevalence of miscarriage can be up to 80% if you have a uterine septum, and this is mind boggling. When I was in training, there were some people who had the line of thought that maybe you don't need to fix the septum until somebody has experienced miscarriage. As somebody who's been through miscarriage myself, I think that is false. Meaning if there's anything you can do to decrease the chance of miscarriage, I wanna be in the camp of doing that because miscarriage is so hard. It is emotionally and physically taxing. And if you have a reason anatomically why that can be fixed and lower your chance of miscarriage back down to your baseline chance, that's where we want you to be. So when you have a miscarriage, that tissue in the middle, it's avascular. That means it doesn't have any blood supply. If we think about what a new pregnancy needs as it comes into the uterus, is it needs some tissue that it can latch onto and grow and grow that placenta into. It needs blood vessels on the other side to form that connection with the placenta. And if it doesn't have it, you're not gonna get a placenta that's functioning and you won't have a pregnancy that can continue. So that is why with a septum, you see a high miscarriage rate. When you fix the septum, you have a drop in miscarriage rate down to your age-related norm. No higher residual miscarriage rate. So this is fantastic. The surgery to fix the septum, it is a surgery. It is a day surgery. You're done in an outpatient center. You go home the same day. It is my favorite surgery to do. So this surgery is something called hysteroscopy. That is where you put a camera inside the uterus and you're able to see the inside of the uterine cavity. You use scissors to resect the septum up to the level of fundus, making it a normal shaped uterine cavity again, instead of having that inside portion coming down to see you. After you resect it, I'm in the camp of believing that you need to prevent scar tissue from forming because if I replace the septum with scar, I haven't really accomplished much. So we wanna do everything we can to prevent scar tissue. Usually this means leaving a little balloon or some type of catheter inside the uterus to keep those walls apart. 
It also means that we want to encourage growth of the uterine lining to get that endometrium, that nice silky part of the uterine lining to grow. And that's typically with high dose estrogen. And we wanna prevent an infection when you have anything in the uterus, so usually with antibiotics. And then the catheter will come out, they'll continue medications for about a month, and then we wanna repeat imaging to make sure the septum is resolved. This is the primary uterine abnormality that we can do anything about, so it's important to understand it completely. Also, it's important to get a right diagnosis. So this brings up a good question about how do we evaluate the uterus. There are a few different ways which we can evaluate the uterine cavity. One is by doing an ultrasound or a saline ultrasound. It's important to know that in a transvaginal ultrasound, the uterus is a potential space, meaning you can't see the endometrium. So things like septums often go completely undiagnosed on a regular ultrasound. Sometimes in the hands of an experienced provider or at the right time of your cycle, one can be seen on a certain view of the ultrasound, but they often get missed. However, a saline ultrasound is where you put a catheter inside the uterus fill the uterus with saline, pushing those two walls apart, and look with an ultrasound, and that is a much better test to diagnose the inside of the uterine cavity and to see things like septums, other abnormalities, fibroids, polyps, scar tissue. So a saline sonogram is a really great test to evaluate the inside of the cavity. A lot of people end up getting an HSG test, which is a hysterosalpingogram, and HSG is a screening test that does show you the inside of the cavity and the fallopian tubes. The advantage is it's really good for the fallopian tubes, but the disadvantage is it's not as great for the inside of the uterus because it's just showing you the outline of the inside of the uterine cavity and you don't have any context for what the outside looks like. So let's think about a septum. The outside of the uterine cavity is gonna be completely normal because fusion happened completely. You just had that reabsorption fail. So from the outside of the uterus, it would look normal. If I put a camera in your belly button and looked at your uterus, it would look normal. But the inside would have a dip or be severely heart-shaped. Now that is easily mistaken with another abnormality called a bicornuate uterus. A bicornuate uterus is a little bit different. So what happened there is you had your little buds, they started to grow, they fused partially so the tops didn't fuse, therefore they reabsorbed what they could, but obviously the tops were separate. So you get a more pronounced heart shape on the outside. The real important thing here is if you go get an x-ray test and it tells you you have a bicornuate or a septum, that test, the HSG, cannot tell the difference between those. Other tests that can include an MRI, which shows the outside and the inside of the uterus, a saline sonogram, or surgery. So something needs to happen. Big asterisk with surgery is that if I put a camera on the inside of the uterus, I can see the inside, but unless I also have a camera on the outside or some type of ultrasound, I can't see the outside. In a bicornuate uterus, you don't need surgery. You can't go and resect out this middle portion, or if I do, I'll end up in your abdominal cavity because there's nothing up there. The uterus did not fuse all the way. So the management of these two things is very different. Bicornuate uteruses don't cause an increase in infertility, but they can cause abnormalities in labor, so increase in breach, so having a baby in the abnormal position, heads not down, and also preterm labor and a higher risk of C-section. And that makes sense because the muscular component of the uterus is all spread out. You don't get that nice, normal contraction that you should normally have. Another abnormality is where the uterus doesn't fuse at all, meaning you have two buds grow, they never fuse. So you have two completely different tracts. So if I put a speculum in your vagina, I would see two different cervical openings. And if I did imaging, I'd see two different uteruses. This is called a didelphus uterus two different horns. So interestingly, this whole little bud developing to the vagina uterus fallopian tubes goes along the same time with the kidney development. And so there's a high overlap. If you have a uterine abnormality, you might have a kidney abnormality also. So you always want to get the kidneys checked to make sure you have two, they're in the right spots. Do you have extra ureters? Like what's going on there? Similar to the bicornuate didelphus, do not tend to cause infertility unless there's obstruction. However, you can have, you have a different shape size of uterus. So abnormal presentation of the baby are common. You can also get an increase of C-section, labor abnormalities, growth restriction, there's not as much space, and preterm birth. Another type of abnormality is called a unicornuate uterus. Same idea as a didelphus, except it's really what happened is one bud failed to develop completely. So you just have the one side of the uterus, one fallopian tube. You have one cervix, because only one side developed, and you have two ovaries, because remember, ovaries come from a different tissue line. You can have the same type of abnormalities, as before, so preterm birth, labor abnormalities, you sometimes have an increase in miscarriage rate just because of the shape of the uterus being a little bit different. 
Interestingly, is some people have what we call a rudimentary horn, which means one side of the uterus didn't develop but didn't disappear. So you have this little like bud, and then the other side is normal. If this little bud has some endometrium in it, like partially developed, it can actually fill with blood, but there's no way for it to get out. So it can cause cyclic pain. It can also back up out the fallopian tube, cause scar tissue, endometriosis. And in those circumstances, we actually want to take that rudimentary horn out or destroy that tissue on the inside so that it can't make menstrual tissue and just back up and become obstructed and painful. Another thing is you can have complete failure of the uterus to develop at all. This is called Meyer Rokitansky Kusterhauser or MRKH. This is where you have complete failure to develop. So none of these structures formed at all. You have two ovaries, so your body makes hormones fine. You have a vagina, at least two thirds of it, because that's different tissue, but you're missing the top third of the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, the fallopian tubes. These are some of the cases where they've gone and tried a uterine transplant to see if they can help people who were born without a uterus carry a child. It's fascinating. But this is a very distinct abnormality where puberty and everything else happens. There's just no bleeding because there's no uterus there. And so patients like this typically present with primary amenorrhea age 16 or so where they have all their secondary sex characteristics developed but they don't have a period. So the take home message here is those are uterine abnormalities. Other things that can happen inside the uterus are fibroids, polyps and scar tissue. And I'm gonna do some extra videos to talk about those specifically. But I think it's important that you know that you could have a birth defect of your uterus, that it's important to get a uterine evaluation as part of your fertility check, and that if you have really severely painful periods, if you don't have periods coming and you have primary amenorrhea, these are reasons to go get things evaluated by your OBGYN because you may be born with a birth defect and never knew. As always, thank you so much for watching and supporting the channel. I appreciate you so much. Please feel free to subscribe, follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, or check out the As Woman podcast for more in-depth fertility-related information. Thanks, friends.